Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Joe Cyril and welcome back to The Runoff, the GP blog podcast. Monaco, known for its elegance, mega rich and super yachts, quickly descended into chaos as a rain-soaked principality provided a fascinating yet scrutinised race. Sergio Perez was victorious in the south of France and as ever, myself, Cameron and Toby will be breaking down his victory and looking ahead to Baku and the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Strap yourselves in, this is the 2022 season, episode 8. Michael, let's go on there. No, no, my exit was so not right. Get in there, Lewis. George Russell. Yeah, the first, Mr. Hamilton. You are the world champion. Well, we're recording this pretty late on Sunday evening, but joining me as ever are Cameron and Toby. Cameron, how are you? I'm good, thanks, mate. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you very much. And Toby, how are you? Um, I'm a bit tired, but apart from that, I'm good. Well, I think we're all very tired, and it was a... It was an elongated race. It was a long race in Monaco, certainly. It took a while to get going, but when it did, Sergio Perez got his tactics right. Charles Leclerc and Ferrari didn't, and Red Bull were victorious. Lads, what did we make of the race? It was a fascinating race, but it it had its peaks and troughs. Yeah, I think Cam just mentioned before that he actually enjoyed the race, and I I do agree with him in that sense that when it got started, it was good. But I was really just annoyed at how long it took to get started and I think that just dampened my mood throughout the whole race and then obviously the red flag happened during the race and then at that point I was just kind of like I I can't really be bothered for this anymore but it did turn out like the end the end kind of like last five minutes um was quite good because it looked like Carlos Sainz could potentially overtake Checo at the front but I mean overall it, it had its its good things and it had its bad things in my opinion but it, the rain made it interesting. So I think that's all I can say for it personally. Cameron, Toby mentioned there, you were a big fan of today's race. Let me hear your reasons why. Yeah, I think Monaco last year of its contract sort of showed why it's such a good race. I mean, why it should be there. I mean, I don't think we can, even with what happened with the conditions, there weren't still weren't many overtakes, but I think it was a, a fascinating race from weather, weather point of view, strategy, Ferrari certainly got it wrong, um, not for the first time either. Whereas Red Bull, again, not for the first time, got it right in strategy. I think that's certainly a strength and weakness in those two teams. Um, and yeah, Red Bull just pulled out the bag, didn't look like they were going to... Well, it looked like with with Perez and Verstappen third and fourth, that was it. Verstappen even said before the race, he was like, yeah, there's not going to be any overtakes. And well, there wasn't many, but he managed to put himself on the podium. Brew Leclerc's bad fortune. And as I said in our... Most recent podcast, the Monaco curse for Leclerc. Uh, well, it happened again, really. Nothing to do with crash or anything like that, but frustrating for him on pole, home race, and then a poor strategy and finish fourth off the podium and loses points to Verstappen, which you didn't really see coming going into the race. But yeah, I really enjoyed the race. Like Toby said, a shame it took quite a while to get going. I would have loved to see them all go out on slick tyres and seen what happened at turn one because it could have been a hungry-esque one where someone goes flying and someone from the back wins, which would have been even better than a Perez win, I think. You mentioned there Ferrari, Charles Leclerc's lost more ground to Max Verstappen. It looks like a little bit the wheels are coming off at Ferrari. It's the first time that they've sort of made a big headline tactical error. They It looked like they'd iron that out of their system, but it, today they, they got it horribly wrong, didn't they, Toby? Yeah, it just it seemed to, to start okay, and then slowly as the race got on, it just edged towards just failure. But, I mean, at, in, in the end, they, they did finish second and fourth, so they got points. I think that is the only positive that they can even think about looking at from this race. Um, there was obviously the, an issue in the pit lane with Charles Leclerc being told to come in and then right at the last second being told to stay out, but he was already in. So it just made him drop down to fourth behind Verstappen. And then at that point, there was no way that he was coming back past him, in my opinion. But I think it's probably one of those where they'll look at it and go, we've made this mistake. It has hurt us a lot, but it's something to learn on. And I don't think we'll see it again. Probably for the next five races maybe another mishap could occur during the rest of the season but that could happen with any team so um i think today is one that they're definitely going to forget soon but you still have to look at it and think that red bull have have come out on top and it's really hurt ferrari cameron the man to benefit from ferrari's misfortune sergio perez he had a frustrating weekend last weekend when he wasn't allowed past max verstappen to attack russell but this weekend he got out in front he kept the position and he got a deserved win. Yeah, for sure. I think well, Perez was quicker than Verstappen all weekend, which I think was a little bit of a shock. But straight from free practice, he was just on form. Looked quicker than Max all weekend, qualified ahead of him. 
And that was basically what won in the race, I think, because obviously if it was flipped the other way around, Verstappen would have been ahead on the track and then would have gained the race lead when all the pit stops happened. So I think, yeah, Perez is rewarded for a, a great qualifying lap. And yeah, his defence from science in the closing stages was was pretty good. I mean, it's not too hard at Monaco to park your car in the right place and stop and overtake. But again, we've seen it happen before. So on his degrading mediums, he managed to, to hold off science and earn a really, really good win. Third in F1, first at Monaco, uh, first of the season and, and really put himself in the championship fight because um, I think he needed a win pretty soon to sort of justify Red Bull not giving it all to Max, if you go, I mean, I think the the Spain call was the right one in Red Bull's mind for how things were going. But Perez getting a win perhaps, perhaps changes that now. They don't go, oh, Verstappen, you're, you're now our title guy. You're the one guy. They now go, oh, if Perez is leading, that might not happen again. And that's what Sergio needs to do because he is in the title fight. He just has to make sure Max doesn't get a too big a lead to him because otherwise team orders will come into play and he'll be frustrated again. But yeah, mega win for Checo. We focused a lot on the front riders in particular for obvious reasons. But further back, there was a little bit of controversy. I think it was Fernando Alonso was P7. I can't remember if he finished there. I'm too tired to remember. But he was just on tyre management. I think he was, or he was managing his pace and he was just holding everyone up. And because the layout of Monaco is so narrow, it made it impossible for Hamilton to get past. And he was just backing everyone up. And it was, I think there was a lot of disgruntled fans saying it just made for no racing whatsoever in that midfield. Yeah, it kind of ruined it a bit. But at the same time, it was quite, I think, fun and, and a little bit exciting to see some drivers getting frustrated. I think there was one point coming down to the Nouvelle Chicane where Hamilton potentially had a chance to overtake but it just wasn't there. So he ended up just sitting behind Alonso, like you said, Joe. I think you can't really say it, or like put that in a bad way though, because he's managed to get himself in that position and hold it for a significant amount of time. So I don't I don't think you can, you can fault. Obviously fans might be upset because they didn't get to see the, potentially the racing they wanted to see. But I, in my opinion, he's done mega to stay in that position and hold all those people behind. Cameron, do you agree or disagree with Toby's point? Yeah, I think it was Fernando knows that Monaco is a hard place to overtake. Hamilton was so much quicker than him. Everyone was behind him, but he managed to hold it out. I mean, he finished over 30 seconds behind Lando Norris, and I'm pretty certain Lando had two more pit stops. If he didn't have two, it was, I think it was two, but there was certainly one where Lando had made up a 30-second gap to Alonso, pitted, then made that gap up again and almost got up to Russell. And it's Fernando just, there was a point where he looked like he was just, he was just tire managing and then sped up and Hamil- dropped Hamilton a little bit. But then that gap closed back up straight away and it was, I'm not really sure what's going on. I, I don't know if Alpine just didn't really have the pace, but I find it hard to imagine he was that much slower than Lando because I think Flando was lapping like three seconds a lap slower than the leading cars, which is pretty mental when Alpine are a midfield team at the top of the midfield, really. So I don't know what was going on, if it was just tyre management, but whatever it was, I mean, it worked for Alonso. So um, fair play to him. Didn't need to overexert himself and, and did well in the end. But yeah, it was certainly frustrating for the man behind him, which is Lewis Hamilton. Um, he certainly had the pace, I think, to, to probably catch up to Lando Norris, but uh, not to be. Fair play to Fernando. Cam, you mentioned it a little while ago that if you park your car in the right place in Monaco, it's going to be pretty hard to overtake. And Lewis Hamilton, who might be one of our winners, who knows? I haven't looked at the document, but he, pre- he had a pretty crappy weekend. So we'll get into the winners and losers now of the Monaco Grand Prix. Toby, I'll start with you. Now, originally, you had George Russell down as a winner, Toby. <laughs> However, we have asked you to change that because George Russell went from P6 to P5. Was it was it P6 to P5? I can't even remember. So your winner is actually Sergio Perez. Now, you can explain yourself <laughs> <laughs> or not. Right, so you've tried to out me here, so I'm going to explain myself. I put Lando Norris on the document as mine, but a certain other person who chooses their winners and losers said that he was going to do Lando Norris because I always get to choose first. True. So I I was left with two minutes before we started recording to choose a winner. and So you go, George Russell. No, I was looking <laughs> and I went, I might just do George Russell just because he's top five again. And, you know, I may like George Russell. I may be a fan of George Russell. No, no mention of the race winner. No, like no, no one would know I'm a George Russell fan, so it's okay. But I have gone with Sergio Perez because he did win the race. He's gone from from P3 in quali up, and I mean, you can't take away from the fact that his, his drive was mega. I don't really have much else to say, to be honest, because I haven't really had the time to think about it too much, apart from the fact that he, he won the race, so he's he's my winner, and he put in a mega, mega drive. Yeah, he got a bit fortunate, didn't he, Cam? But he has put in a good drive. Yeah, I think... 
fortunate, maybe. I think more just really good from Red Bull. I think Red Bull are the experts uh, on the pit wall in terms of strategy and have been for a little while in F1. It's what got them at least a little bit close to Mercedes um, during Mercedes' dominant years. And it's worked here because this looked like Ferraris to lose and Red Bull made them lose basically through their strategy. So Perez, great drive, but I think he'll be thanking the engineers and everyone on the the pit wall for that strategy basically. Going for the overcut. Yep. Yeah, well, well done, Sergio. You are officially a winner this week, albeit Toby didn't want to give you that title. Toby, we won't out you any longer. Cameron, Toby's already mentioned your winner, Lando Norris. Yeah, sorry for taking him, but I, I just wanted to talk about Lando Norris because pretty insane what he's done, really. Um, last weekend's tonsillitis, um, still feeling the effects now, and it's not your regular common cold, really. So I'm not quite sure how he competed in Spain, obviously still feeling the effects now, but was just on it as per last year he was top of the midfield this year again looks top of the midfield um if you're going by the actual standings he went from p5 and qualifying to p6 so you know he wouldn't be the obvious standout (laughs) i can see toby in the background but he got the fastest lap of the race and he pitted when 30 seconds behind George Russell after that pit stop and closed up to 0.3 seconds at the checkered flag i think had it been the full race distance like we would have had if there was no rain that kind of thing or no delay then I think he very well, he, he might have not been able to do anything. Obviously, Science and Perez showed it's hard to overtake, but maybe he would have been able to get a move done, put the pressure on George, George maybe missed a chicane or that kind of thing. But yeah, I thought Lando Norris really deserves a bit more, you know, a bit, he deserves praise for what he's done because I think he's one of those drivers, we spoke about Bottas before, one of those drivers who sort of just goes under the radar for a, a good P6 every week or what, that, that kind of thing. And it deserves to be praised. And I think this weekend, especially, obviously got a podium in Monaco last season. He's clearly good around there, lapped Daniel Ricciardo last last season. And again, was completely on top of Ricciardo, who used to be an expert around Monaco. I th- I'm not sure quite how much pace McLaren actually had, but Norris certainly had a lot. And I think, yeah, he should be, he was my winner. Uh, and I wanted to talk about him rather than let Toby have first pick again. Well, Toby, I'm going to apologise for exposing you, but now is your chance to say why you were going to pick Lando Norris as your winner. Well, I mean, Cam kind of just said it, so I don't, I don't really know what else to say. He summed it up quite well, so I'll give him that one. I think we're all too tired to, to actually explain <laughs> that any further. So we'll go on to the losers now. The losers, Cam, two big losers this week, and you've put two down. Yeah. Uh, kind of cheating here, but I normally do on losers and just because why not? Um, loser, so yeah. <laughs> so the first one, uh, unfortunately, because I really wanted him to do well, is Charles Leclerc. He still finished fourth, so it's not the end of the world and not one you just normally shoot associate with sort of someone who's lost the race. But yeah, starting on pole, home race, he'll be thinking going to bed on Saturday night, thinking right, this this is my time. The rain comes down, and I'm sure he's thinking, oh no. Here, here we go again. And it, we went again. Monaco, something about it. This time, it wasn't his fault. Strategy from Ferrari kind of screwed him up. But at the same time, I, I don't think what Ferrari did was was the worst call in the world. It was just Red Bull got it spot on. Leclerc will be devastated. I think he, he said as much. And it's frustrating because I think this, for the championship as well, was one he, he needed to win, not just for his own home race kind of thing but yeah for the championship he needed to win that and not only is you know he lost put Sergio Perez won the race but he somehow lost ground to Verstappen even though Verstappen qualified fourth it was that's that's maybe the the thing that hurts the most for him is the fact that he's lost even more ground to Verstappen in the championship despite there being three places between them at the starting grid so yeah, Charles Leclerc, not a good weekend. And then the other one I wanted to talk about was Lewis Hamilton. Um, spoke about Alonso a little bit earlier. And yeah, that was the story of Hamilton's race. Just seeing the back of Fernando Alonso's car. Those two know each other well. And Hamilton just couldn't get a move done. George Russell was miles ahead. Obviously, Hamilton, it was just qualifying. I think if it was similar to, obviously, Spain, Hamilton had an unreal sort of recovery drive. But now Russell is winning the qualifying battle between the two of them. Um and he's winning the race battle, which is not something we've seen with Hamilton in a long time. So it'll be interesting to see where this goes, This, this, those two pairing and, and seeing who can come out on top at the end of the season. Because it won't be a great look for Lewis if he gets beaten by... It won't be a good look for Lewis if he gets beaten by Russell in Russell's first year at Mercedes, really. Yeah, two drivers who are... Well, Charles Leclerc's in a pretty sticky run of form and Lewis Hamilton even stickier. Toby... 
coming back to you now. You've been able to pick this one yourself. Who is your winner? Uh, sorry, your loser this week. I've quickly added to my choice because I saw their results and I kind of think it would be better to look at them as a whole. So my, my losers are Alpha Tauri. Um, yesterday, Yuki outperformed Pierre in qualifying, although Pierre has kind of had a a bit of misfortune. I think Yuki qualified in 11th and Pierre qualified in 17th, whereas in the race they actually switched positions and Yuki finished 17th when Pierre finished 11th. So it's obviously a, it's a it's a good drive from Pierre Gasly um, but you, you, I think Yuki was just off the pace throughout the whole race. Like He didn't seem anywhere near where he should be at all. But my main loser is Pierre Gasly, mainly because it, um, it looked like he was on for a points finish. In the end, he just he obviously didn't get it. He was he was one spot out. That was because Ocon had a penalty. He moved up to eleventh. But when Gasly switched to the Inters first in the race, he got through the field quite quickly and up to up to twelfth. So it looked like there was a potential points finish there. But he just just kind of slowed down and and didn't really gain anything else from that. So they they are my losers. It's not really like a mega loser situation compared to like Charles Leclerc. Um, but from what I could see, they'll probably feel like they're losers this weekend. Cameron's got his hand up. I think he wants to talk. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add on that, but I think it's a bit harsh on Pierre because I think it was a great drive, but I know what you mean. I think points were certainly there for him. Oh, I don't know. Pierre's had a weird start to the season. Um, I was going to say like, the exact same thing, to be fair. Yeah, he's pretty on par now with, with Yuki in terms of everything. It, it seemed like Pierre had always sort of got the most out of the Alvatari, whereas now it doesn't quite seem like that. It might just be the car's not that great. Um, on Yuki, I think he missed the corner at Sandefort about four times in the race, which is why he dropped back so much. But yeah, fair play, I think, for Gasly for going on to intermediates so quickly. I think he went on about four laps before anyone else, which was pretty brave to do, and it, it paid off to an extent. But yeah, points so close yet so far for him. Um, and I also think Haas... Uh, deserve a shout out for for Lusa because two retirements um not exactly ideal Schumacher obviously hitting the wall when Magnuson... not just two retirements their their car looks like it's made of Lego yeah no yeah obviously Schumacher just lost it in the wall car split in half um Magnuson the TV coverage pan to Magnuson uh looking at it who I had no idea had retired because they yeah, had, he, had no he, coverage of him retiring he just appeared in the pit lane looking at the crash like how of nowhere. <laughs> No, no, the commentators hadn't mentioned it. I think one of the losers this week is definitely Sky and their broadcast because, yeah, well, by all accounts, they've had a shocker. Yeah, obviously, it's Monaco have their own independent broadcasting. Obviously, Sky don't actually do it, which is what we saw last year with the Lance Stroll replay thing. So, I don't think, yeah, I think the Monaco direction needs, um, well, to hand reins to Sky perhaps because it might be a little bit better. Yeah, well, tricky times for everyone mentioned there. They are our winners and losers of the Monaco Grand Prix. But now we're going to look forward to two weeks' time, the Azerbaijan Grand Prix in the Baku City Street Circuit. Well, lads, Baku last year, Sergio Perez's first victory for Red Bull. It was a pretty crazy race because for all the world, it looked like it was a Max Verstappen W. Then his tyre blew up and then Lance Stroll's tyre blew up and then Lewis Hamilton ran off as he tried to take the lead, and Sergio Perez won with Ocon and Vettel on the podium. That was a pretty crazy race last year. No, it wasn't Vettel and Ocon <laughs> on the podium. It was and Vettel it was... and Gasly on the podium. And it was Stroll Cameron first. Shaking him. It was Stroll first, then Verstappen. But yeah, the tyre blew up. Yeah, yeah. Drivers blew their tyres, and Lewis Hamilton ran off, and there was a Frenchman and a German on the podium alongside Perez. I've lost the plot. But either way, it was a pretty fascinating race last season. <laughs> take, the post, very, take the spotlight off me I'll steal it it was very unexpected which made it a, a good spectacle I don't think Lewis Hamilton will be hitting his special magic button this year and I don't think he'll be near the front so uh, I doubt we'll see that again but it <laughs> it was just no one like you said no one thought that anyone else would win apart from Verstappen because he looked so comfortable out front um, we did get a good meme from it though with Verstappen kicking his tyre which is which has been spread around like F1 social media for the past year. I I I don't really know if that will happen this year, but I think the the battle at the front will be interesting between Ferrari and Red Bull in in Baku. Yeah, it certainly will be because Ferrari need a response and quickly. It looks like they've got the pace to do it. 
Leclerc was on pole. They got their strategy wrong this week, but it's crucial they bounce back in Baku, isn't it? Back in yeah. Baku, isn't it, Cam? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I'm just going to add on the Baku circuit. I just really like it. I think it's pretty rare for a street circuit to be really good for overtaking opportunities. Um, and Baku's pretty decent, I think. I, the Obviously, the straight that's about 40 miles long, um, or it seems anyway, is, is pretty epic. And yeah, I'm expecting a good race. I think it was a good one last year. I think it was helped by the Pirellis blowing up, um, basically, and the, the race restart we had, um, the excitement of that. But yeah, looking forward to it. I think it'll be a good race. Um, and hopefully we'll see more Leclerc, Verstappen actual battles on track because we haven't seen that for a, for a couple of races now. I want to see some more, some more, you know, will to will action between those two because the first couple of rounds were, were pretty epic for that. Yep. Ferrari need a response, but Red Bull go in as strong favourites and Max Verstappen will be at the front of that. We have been making our predictions now for seven races, seven weeks now. Um, and we've all been pretty useless at them. Me in particular. And we thought we'd highlight that by making a point system. Cameron, you're going to explain where we're at so far because I haven't got the information at hand. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, well, we're just going to do it from Monaco onwards because um, I don't want to look back over all the podcasts because that would take too long. Uh, but the idea is that obviously we do poll winner and a surprise prediction. So if you get poll right, one point. If you get the winner right, one point. And if you get the surprise right, three points because obviously it's a little bit harder to guess. So for oh, the I Monaco predictions, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for the Monaco Excuse predictions. Me, Toby uh, got one point because he predicted Sergio Perez would win the race. I got one point because I predicted Charles Leclerc would be on pole. And Mr. Tyrrell got a big fat zero because he thought Lewis Hamilton was going to be on pole and win and Bottas would be on the podium. I think there's been some mistake there. So it's uh, need to go back and check the records. One, one, zero after, well, we're calling it week one, even though it's seven yeah. races in. Well, you two are top, tied top. I'm on my own in last place. But this week's predictions, well, next a fortnight's predictions. Uh, Baku, Cameron, as you've just explained it, you can start. Who okay. are you going for, your winner? Uh, winner of the race, I think it will be a Sergio Perez double. He's going to do back-to-back. I think back the to back. Monaco will be uh, pretty high. Your pole position. Pole position, that's, that's it, that's it. Pole My pole position. position will also be Sergio Perez. I think, I just don't know, I, I feel like Sergio's going to get a lot of confidence from this Monaco win uh, and be the thing he needs to, to push on for the championship. And I'll save you a, a task here, mate. My surprise uh, will you. be <laughs> will be that Max Verstappen retires from the race. Okay. Yeah, Max Verstappen, he's losing ground in the title race or just giving a chance for Leclerc to make it up. Cameron. No, Toby. <laughs> Toby. <laughs> Who is your winner at pole position and surprise this week? Okay, well, I'll start with pole because that makes the most logical sense. Um, and I'm going to guess Charles Leclerc pole, Max Verstappen victory, and then my surprise is going to be... Don't be kidding, uh, man. Daniel Ricciardo points finish. The fact that that's now considered a surprise... <laughs> Exactly. Mental. <laughs> How the Not mighty like have seven fallen. Grand Prix. <laughs> How the mighty have fallen. <laughs> In a mac- and he's a McLaren. <laughs> <laughs> Easy point. We can we count that? Have Easy we got an independent that. adjudicator to like decide? Where I don't think that counts. Come on. Does Lewis okay, Hamilton winning okay. a race count as a surprise okay. now? Right. A, a Daniel Ricciardo top seven. Yeah. Okay. We'll just about well, allow that. We'll, we'll let you have that because he probably not get that top too. three points for that. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. If he finishes eighth, ninth, or tenth, I'm going to be absolutely fuming. Well, I I'm going with a Max Verstappen pole position. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going for a Charles Leclerc pole position, a George Russell victory. What is you two obsessed with mistakes? Because <laughs> no. they're going to do it eventually. <laughs> they're still sandbagging. And I'll also go with a Pierre Gasly top five. There you go. That's a proper surprise. That, that's a real on, surprise. That's how you do it. I went random. Pierre like, Gasly, I'm you're finishing P5. Lads, days. we're all very tired, but thank you very much for joining me late on this Sunday evening. Thank you for having us. Cheers, Joe. Don't forget, follow us on Spotify, follow us on Twitter. You can follow us for all the updates at gpblog.com. This has been the runoff. We'll see you in two weeks' time for the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. See you then.